right now. Uh, Professor Dwight Hopkins, Professor Jonathan Tran, thank you so much for joining us uh, at Theology Lab. It's a pleasure to be here with the High Rock community and the community beyond. Same here. Thank you so much. We've been looking forward to this all week. Okay, so we're having a conversation about connections between faith, wealth, and race, uh, particularly when we're talking about wealth. It'll be about how we relate to capitalism. Just to get us started, can you give us a sense about how you became interested in these topics? Uh, and Dwight, can I ask you to go first? Sure. I, um, I'm originally from the South. I was born uh, under segregation, so when we die off, we'll be the last connection to legal set legal segregation and um so we grew up in a situation where all the different classes were present even the wealthy blacks and unemployed black we didn't have much unemployment actually so i saw class i saw politics economics i saw race every day because all everybody was there and uh, so i've been interested in how those two things connect you know political economy wealth ownership and of course the racial dimensions by ethnic dimensions of that and studied that in college, Afro-American studies and global political economy, and went on to do some other things with business theology and humanity for the common good. Yeah, I mean, it's hard to imagine uh, anyone in America who um, doesn't have to be aware of questions of race, uh, economy, questions of wealth, Christianity. I grew up in, I was born in Vietnam. My family came from a fair amount of wealth. We were part of the aristocratic North um, and we moved South when the communist revolution in 54 happened and then we're really poor. And then we came to America as war refugees. You can imagine we're poor then as well. Uh, and uh, that's of course when I came, began to come to terms um, with the racial realities of America and specifically uh, where Asian Americans fit or don't fit in that story, uh, while fitting pretty squarely in the story of wealth and wealth accumulation, especially as uh, migrant communities. So uh, these are questions I've thought about my whole life. I became a Christian pretty late uh, in college, and uh, since then it's been a kind of full engagement with these questions. Thanks for that. Um, Let's get into a question here that gives you a chance to lay out your theological uh, visions, the visions that animate your work. Um, in a minute, I'll be turning towards questions about wealth and capitalism, but let's talk about uh, how theology informs your work first. Can you give us a sense of the theological picture that informs your approach to questions around wealth and capitalism? Uh, Jonathan, would you get us started with this? Sure, I begin with a kind of ancient church picture of creation and God's salvation, which the early church referred to often as the divine economy. The idea that God creates out of God's grace, not because God needs something, there isn't some kind of extrinsic or external instrumental value that God is trying to get out of creation or say extract from creation. Uh, God imbues us with the same sociality um, to imagine ourselves living in creation that is abundantly set up for us. Sin comes into the story by way of the language of Augustine, Gregory, around privation, predatory relationships uh, around community, and the distortion of those which are given freely by God uh, are things that we kind of uh, inhabit and then ruin or break or uh, control from the inside. Um, I'm really interested in how those stories relate to each other, especially the story that even in a world that has fallen, fallen in not only individual but systemic forms of privation, how God's gift and good and divine economy still shows itself as good news. And so I'm radically interested in this question about how Christian communities live into this and show a different picture of the world. Dwight, how about you? Um, I, I look at the biblical text, and as I look at the Exodus story, Exodus 3 in particular, there's a, as the story goes, there's a covenant between Yahweh and the ancient Israel people who are slaves in Egypt. And the promise is that if they follow Yahweh, these uh, ancient Israel people will be delivered into a, a real land, a material land, and it will have all the abundance that it needs, milk and honey which is could be literal for that generation, but also, you know, for today, it means full, full abundance. 
So there's a material dimension to freedom uh, for people who are enslaved uh, physically as well as spiritually. And I see that same story or a large part of that story in the New Testament, particularly in uh, Luke chapter four, where it talks about Jesus makes the first proclamation about freedom for all human beings. And there too, you know, material reward. Did you feed me? Did you clothe me? Attend to the widow. And so too, um, the the proclamation, I call the proclamation of Matthew, uh, the sheep and the goat story where Jesus says, you know, you know, you did this to the least of these, you did this to me. Well, what are those least of these? They're material concrete examples. Again, did you feed me? Did you clothe me? Did you house me? Did you come see me in prison? Did you give me water when I was thirsty? So for me, theology is linked to the concrete reality here. It's holistic. We need emotional healing. We need spiritual healing. But we also need concrete material um, capital to in order to for people to flourish. Um, and so, you know, I'm working on a project uh, called Faith Plus Wealth Equals Freedom, which is, um, we can talk more about that, but it's following that that source of the scripture, those lines, those stories that to me feed into that. Um, and I think too, you know, it says that we should be with those who are suffering, those who need help, those who need clothing, hospitals, those who need schools, those who need care of their kids. To me, those are the things that um, really matter as far as my uh, theology and the question of, of, of capital or wealth. I uh, hear your responses, drawing on scripture, drawing on tradition, asking what it means for the present. Um, as we go forward, we'll be talking about questions about wealth and economy and continue to invite you to bring your theological visions. Show us how that bears on these questions. Um, okay, so let me turn now to this question. Uh, I want to give folks here a general sense of the visions that you cast in your work and how we might think about and relate to our capitalist market system. Okay, so I'm recognizing here that our time constraints here mean that you're going to be having to generalize a little bit. But can you give us a snapshot of two different things? How does your work speak to our relationship to wealth and how we relate to capitalism? And then what's one way you see this as having practical significance for us? Uh, Dwight, would you go first here? Yeah, I try to write about, I try to teach about, I try to speak about and have relationships about human beings in relationship to wealth. In fact, everything I've written and talked about has expressed it in, in various ways, but that's been the glue. Um, so what my vision is to help people build healthy communities and healthy individuals in communities. That's basically what I've been trying to do as far as my research and writing. It manifests in different ways. And it seems to me that one way to have a healthy community and healthy individuals in community that Christianity has a role to play. So the other religions and other non-religions, but for me, that's my journey, that's my story. And particularly around the question of faith plus wealth equals freedom. So by faith, I mean, those who in general, those who have a vision of a new society that's helpful for all people. Wealth for me means who owns earth, air and water. And freedom is setting up a healthy society and healthy individual society where people owe no one and no thing, anything. Uh, that would be a new land of milk and honey. Now, what pushes that particularly are people who don't have resources now a lot, right? So we talk particularly about people who are minorities, however that's played out, people out of the mainstream, people who are, are suffering, and also people who have solutions. To, they actually do have solutions to the problems that are affecting them. So it's, that's my larger vision and what I've drawn in my sort of research project but really trying to use the energy of people who are who are left out, left behind, and locked out uh, as well. Joy, can I add one other thing to to ask you to speak to? Sure. Can you um can you give us a sense of how you see uh, people of faith relating to capitalism in a, like a positive way? An example of that. Sure. Uh, some business schools, believe it or not, have uh, prayer meetings. Uh, you know. So that's one concrete way. Christians who are in certain business schools, I won't name them because I'll leave them out. Um, well, I know one is Kellogg School of Management at Northwestern. They have professors and students there at the MBA program who pray. Um, so actual people who are dealing with wealth, but also Christian, Christian followers believing in Jesus Christ. 
I think also that depending on how we understand social impact, or let me put it more specifically, social entrepreneurship, the guiding principles of a lot of social impact and social entrepreneurship is a triple bottom line, people, profit, and the environment. So social impact, and that can be from venture capital uh, to you know, environment, social governance, forms of inclusion. Uh, and I'm not just talking about a lot of the, which is a good intended, the, there was like 23 billion or $32 billion from the private sector, Wall Street, Silicon Valley, move with Hollywood after in 2020, literally, uh, I think like 800,000 actually got, but I'm talking about people are more on the ground who are not in the he headlines, these loose networks that are people are trying to get together. Specifically, people of color have been doing it, but also there have been white uh, young students and entrepreneurs as well. So actual Christians in business, as well as uh, social impact, social entrepreneurship, a triple bottom line. Jonathan, how about you? So uh, in the recent book that you mentioned, Asian Americans in the Spirit of Racial Capitalism, I tried to tell the story of, um, I mean, capitalism, of course, names uh, many, many things. So I tried to pick up on an account I developed called Racial Capitalism, following from thinkers, say, in the, the broad uh, Black radical tradition uh, that tries to understand the, the relationship between, say, capital, race, uh, forms of and systems of domination um, that try to understand them systemically. And systemically is a word that's thrown around. I just mean the kind of deep interrelationship between things. Um, and so I had uh, been like many people in America, I've been taught to see racism as largely a personal or even mental, psychological. Uh, way of thinking about others uh, driven by prejudice or stereotypes, um, which sometimes that analysis seemed to talk about systems or structures or institutions, concrete realities of the kind um, Professor Hopkins mentions, but they didn't first and sometimes never got to those questions as if we could, as if the main problem of racism was simply people having bad thoughts about one another as if those didn't bear out on practical sets and, of realities. So, so I offer an account of racism that is, um, you know, a picture of capital kind of running amok in the world and looking for systems of ideological justification and that that's what race supplies. Uh, from that big argument, there's two primary questions I think that come out of an argument like that. One, if race played that kind of role, what is the role of race going forward? And this has been a question posed very powerfully for the last you know, 100 years. Uh, I think because people caught on to the, um, how the game was hedged in this kind of way. Uh, but but it, the reality is that people live race lives uh, and out of race lives, can come extraordinarily powerful forms of human dignity and power and creativity and ingenuity. Uh, but it also comes with that first and haunted story in history. So how do we go forward? And you can look at folks like Tony Morrison's remarkable essay, Home, or Stuart Hall's essay on race and articulation. These folks are wrestling and imploring us to wrestle with the question, what do we do with race going forward? The second question is, well, what do we do with an economy where one of the principal ways of thinking about um, creatures, human and non-human creatures, is extraction and exploitation? Are there other idioms of political economy uh, that can imagine, say, the relationship between communities and markets, individuals and other individuals, uh, beyond, say, zero sum, beyond, um, distorted notions of scarcity beyond competition. Uh, and so just because you prosecute, as I do, an argument about how capitalism and racism are deeply intertwined, it's not so easy as then saying, well, uh, let's not talk about race ever again, or let's not talk about capital. Uh, those are both foolish routes. I think the more difficult and more interesting path is to try to think about them beyond, uh, but also continuously within their difficult histories. Uh, and I think these are questions for all of us um, who live in the world today. 
Jonathan, one term there I'm going to ask you to define, uh, political economy. Give us a sense of what you mean in that term. Uh, political economy is just a way of saying the, you know, it, it, again, it goes back to that picture of systemic, uh, the interrelationship between things. Uh, I, I think it's obvious for a lot of people when they talk about racism that it's a political reality. Uh, for a long time in American history, it was also obvious that we we're also talking about uh, an economic reality about questions of class. And for lots of people, probably because they live on the underside of that history, that's still obvious for a lot of us who are wealthy, who live elite lives, uh, separated from um, under-resourced communities. We often forget that, and that's a convenient forgetting because then we can move racism to a much more convenient picture that I talked about earlier, kind of this individual psychology um, that is divorced from the reality in how it deals with, say, who gets to own businesses, how wealth is transferred or not, who gets to go to school, uh, who has access to medical care. Those kinds of concrete realities are deeply intertwined uh, with, um, you say, the diseased imagination of racism, and we need to think really hard about that. So political economy is a kind of way, of, a, a form of analysis that tries to take all of that in consideration. Yeah, that's helpful. Um, okay, so I want to I want to go to the question. This question relates to community. All right. So in reading your work, I see both moving, convicting, challenging portrayals of community. Jonathan, I think about. The example you give in part one of your book about the relationship between the Delta Chinese and their African-American neighbors, and you talk about how something was missed because they remained economic strangers. And then you give this beautiful picture in the second part of the book of the folks at Redeemer Church and the way they lived with this sense of shared time. Um, do I, I think about the descriptions and community between slaveholding Christians and enslaved people and the destruction that that brought upon uh, forms of life amongst the enslaved people. And then also how, you know, you use this term from, uh, from sundown to sun up and how the enslaved people forged life giving community and culture during this time. So here's the question I want to, I want to get at. Um, if our faith does compel us to pursue economic repair, to have a positive relationship to, to wealth and trying to do good with it, um, what do you think the role of community should be? Um, are there ways today that we should see community as helping us foster these goals or maybe also be aware of ways that community can hinder it? In the book, I tell two stories, one about um, Chinese migrants in the 19th century uh, who come to the U.S. as exploitable and exploited labor, often called coolie labor. Uh, they land in the um, Delta, Mississippi. Um, which as we know is the bedrock of uh, King Cotton and a global, um, globally powerful economy completely run uh, through a slave economy between Mississippi, Manhattan, and Manchester. Um, so the Chinese folks are brought in after emancipation and brought in as kind of replacement labor. Um, they catch, they figure out the scheme because they're not, um, legally enslaved in the way that black folks were, they have some opportunities. What I look at then is the opportunities, what, what they make of the opportunities in sharing life with other oppressed people. And uh, they develop business models that I describe as largely extractive and exploitative um, with very little to no investment in the communities that they're literally a part of. Now, they're in a difficult spot because they are also exercised from the white community. And so, and, and I try to say that this is probably a better picture of the kinds of systemic racism that we participate in. Their life with black people wasn't driven by animus. It just produced it because they primarily saw their black neighbors as folks to make money. The second part of the book then tries to tell the story of uh, another Asian American community that imagines themselves continuous with the community part of it, uh, mentored by it, authorized by it. And so they live in the Bayview Hunters Point part of San Francisco, um, part of the Silicon Valley. And they there they kind of um, make a life with their neighbors. Uh, from that, they have a church, they have a software company, they start a local school. 
the point of the software company is to generate wealth and to redistribute wealth to local businesses um, owned by members of that community. So sorry about the audio again. Um, let me ask a follow-up to that, if that's okay. Is there anything, as you've looked, especially at the Redeemer community, and there, if there was something like a, a key concept that relates to community there that you thought was essential for them doing imaginative work around economic repair, what would it be? Well, I mean, it, it goes back to the question itself is, um, in there are many ways in which capital and capitalism or participation in in the market reality that we live in can be community killers, um, that they are driven by individual um, consumption and wealth um, and passed on in incredibly narrow on community ways. But, you know, markets are things of communities. They are ways in which communities exchange and share common life together. And so what we see is these distortions of, of say, of individualistic approaches that these kind of community killers are not actually commitments to market, but they're anti-market if you understand market as community oriented. So, um, and that was one of the most powerful things about the Redeemer community is the community they themselves have as a group of worshiping Christians and the community they imagine that they've been called to, uh, that is their neighbors and trying to respond uh, concretely to the kinds of realities that they experience and come to see insofar as they live in community. Appreciate that. Uh, Dwight, I, uh, I know that you are a venture capitalist alongside being a, a very well-established academic. Um, you are invested in communities. Can you tell me what you see as the uh, the role you see of communities in addressing questions of wealth, bringing about opportunity? Great question. I think the the communities exist everywhere in the United States. Um, oftentimes, they're the exception to the overall uh, reality of those people that they belong with. Uh, for example, <clears throat> even on the segregation, which I was born, I was born uh, in St. Philip's Colored Hospital on First and Broad in Richmond. My birth certificate says gender, I mean, race, colored. So I still have colored on my um, birth certificate. And my older brother, who's, uh, you know, he's he's the, he was playing with people in, when he was uh, in the 1940s. I'm the youngest of eight, and uh, he tells stories that his the best 11 year old baseball player for them. So this is 1940s was a young white girl who played baseball. <laughs> so there's stories of there are exceptions to every every you know every rule, but there is a rule. There is a rule. There's a systemic rule. But the exception. So I'm curious about these various, uh, you know, sub communities, right? That we don't necessarily hear about, but they're out there. And I could give lots of stories from a Hopkins family in um, Richmond about that. Um, so community exists everywhere. I think it's important for me to recognize, and it's hard to do it sometimes because of the intensity of the crust of oppression and the systemic things that Jonathan's talking about. But I often see communities everywhere, uh, or exceptions to the rule. I think that's one just to, to, for me to keep that in mind, right? Sometimes it's difficult to do that. Um, I think also that um, you know people who are on the underside find ways to use the market to help build community. I think Jonathan mentioned that both in his book is the two two they aren't really case studies; they're really just what America means. But he he says two cases more than that, at least I think so. Um, so in, under segregation, we all live together. The wealthy black there are wealthy blacks in the South. They were usually like mulattoes who were passing as white, but we knew they were black people. And those of us who were homeowners <clears throat> and then those who were living the public projects, we all lived together. And I used to go across the street uh, or down the street from our house to the projects to play sports and check out young ladies, I suppose. <laughs> um, and there was a woman who lived in one of the projects and she had a virtual store there and everybody knew it. Nobody snitched on her, right? But it was a place to buy things that you couldn't get at the, at the, uh, supermarket or the regular pharmacy. I don't know where she got this stuff, wholesale or whatever. So she, that she used the economy to help the sub-community of, of Blacks and Coloreds. And it was also a place where people hung out. You know, it was a safe place. People went in there. There was no drinking, no smoking, no gambling, no no violence around there. And so uh, it was an interesting example growing up to see how people try to use whatever leverage they had by playing with the market. 
over against the larger trends that the market presents, you know, which is we've all all talked about. Um, and then the question too is uh, how we're, you know, we're highly privileged, uh, like those of us, say, we just had a forum today on black people at University of Chicago, black academics. And, you know, it's a who's who was here, right? And then how the question is, are we able to use those positions to facilitate communities outside of University of Chicago in such a way that it democratizes access to education, resources? Um, you know, how do we use that market, both economic market, but social capital market that big institutions like University of Chicago and um, all over? have and how do we have access to that or allow access to people in the community and how do we democratize that or open it up in such a way that it speaks to the larger question of the systemic piece at the same time as tries to build maybe counter communities or counter use of capital uh and people amongst people who really don't who've never even been across cottage grove is the western border university of chicago they've lived on the south side of chicago for generations never crossed cottage grove so um, and so, you know, so capital can be, a, a, a not only just a venture, it can be a, an adventure if it's driven by those communities um, who are outside the mainstream. It's just another thing. So I was, for 18 years, I did men's ministry on the South Side of Chicago. I'm too old now, so I, I can't run fast and all that. But I listen, you know, you one in the morning, gunfire. I mean, literally, I was a community organizer. And um, we used the church as an instrument for helping build community where people are struggling to be community. And we also engaged in black professionals helping the community. Some were bankers, some were academics. And, but also inevitably we had to be pastoral because people were hurting so badly. And that was important too. So I've, you know, I've lived it in a small way. I don't mean a national movement or anything like that, but in my own small way, I see communities, possibilities everywhere. And there are instances, whether or not it's a dominant trend is another question of people using capital to help community. I want to move now in our conversation to have you start looking at the work of one another. Let me, Jonathan, let me go to you first on this. Um, is there anything within Dwight's approach uh, that challenges or informs the way that you think about our relationship as Christians to wealth and capitalism? Well, I, I mean, the question will go one way for me, not likely that way for him. <laughs> I mean, Professor Hopkins is an iconic figure in uh, Christian theology. So, um, yeah, I mean, I'm very suspicious of, of wealth. Um, I'm suspicious of what it does to people, what it does to me. Um, uh, growing up poor, I mean, I still have dreams of wealth and my family has dreams of wealth for me. They keep on asking, hold on, what kind of doctor are you? Because <laughs> you don't seem to be making <laughs> the money making kind. So, um, and, you know, I think scripture offers a picture of wealth that is, you know, contributes the, to that suspicion. The challenge, though, and and I think what capitalism, what, what capitalism, as much as it names a lot of things, what it names for me is a system that secures and encourages those ways of thinking about the world, uh, the world as um, made in scarcity, not abundance, uh, people made it for as competitors, not community, um, so on and so forth. But the the ongoing, maybe deeper temptation of Christianity is the the Gnostic temptation or the anti the Manichaean temptation to neatly divide the world between the good guys and the bad guys, good and evil. Christianity on the good side, capitalism on the other. Uh, not only is that tempting certain heretical ways of thinking about the world. Um, uh, but it also lives, leads to a kind of lack of practical reality. Um, there is no part of us that can step outside of the reality of global capital at this point. And there's very little of us that are implicated in its processes. So what I see Professor Hopkins doing is trying to inhabit that space um, and thinking through the practical realities, my guess, because he spent 20 years as an organizer and saw realities and saw the benefits of entrepreneurship and wealth development and teaching financial literacy, 
um, teaching people to understand how the economy works often against them and how they can develop forms of humanity and agency within that. Uh, that is incredibly challenging to me um, because it is uh, both because it ch chastens a certain kind of um, view that might tend more towards something like abolition, uh, but also because it is born, I imagine, of deep Christian hope. And uh, that to me, you know, when I became a Christian, what I loved most about Christianity and still do is the incredible picture of hope while never um never um trying to ignore the reasons for despair um and so how do we live into stories of hope um at, especially where hope is tied to practical states of affairs practical realities and so it's it's incredibly challenging to me to think through these questions um so I appreciate your response there, Jonathan. Um, your the way you uh, share really with your own convictions that come through very clearly in this book and and forcefully, but also this openness to be thinking, uh, you know, with with Dwight's work. Um, Dwight, let me put this question to you. Um, are there any ways that Jonathan's work or things that have been brought up here uh, challenge your own, or are there any kind of uh, critiques or concerns that you might bring up here uh, for your own work when engaging capitalism? Well, I appreciate all the work that <clears throat> Jonathan has done when he was a student, and now he's <clears throat> has carved his own star on the walkway of academic fame. He's quite humble, but people read his books and his resume, and I think they'll come to the same conclusion. I appreciate several things. One is the larger uh, framework <clears throat> of racial capitalism, and a lot of people use that word, or quite a number, but he's able to take theory and break it down. So not only just us academics can understand it, but everyday people can understand it and Christians particularly. That's very difficult to do. And I think it's, you know, he's a minority, a good example of a minority of, of academia. So I really appreciate that. And it's also a challenge to me because, you know, I'm at a institution that talks a lot about theory and method. So I have to be careful not to get swept up into that. So it's a challenge just to, to approach linking important and lofty ideas. I mean, lofty in the sense that they're very complex with everyday people and everyday Christians. I also appreciate the fact and challenge to being pushed more to put texture. That is, he's he uses like two case, two communities. So it's not just larger blah, blah, you know, back and forth, ideological, political, but it's actually grounded and, you know, top right, re top rate research um, looking at people, hearing their voices. That's also very important in um, talking about, uh, again, faith, wealth, capitalism, those types of things. So I'm reminded from his method in his book of dealing with real communities to take on, in my work, even more so, keep my eye on the on the ground. Well, who am I talking about, right? It just, um, and I think too that, you know, I think he actually... <laughs> He sort of spoke to it because I was going to say in his work, there's hope. But I mean, his his statement about him being driven as a Christian for hope, um, I learned from how hope can, you know, emerge out of uh, critical analysis, you know, critique and struggle that people are going through, that there's always hope. And we both resonate. I think I, we resonate as Christians. What keeps me going is the hope. That's the hope. You know, that's the hope. There's always a resurrection, you know. Um even if it happens every year, but it's still a resurrection takes place. Um, so, you know, appreciation and a challenge on those three points, right? You know, linking theory and practice to being grounded in communities and three, um, even in the midst of the deconstruction and appreciating the deep struggles that people go through, how do you hold hope um, as a Christian particularly? And I think, you know, he sort of summed it up because he sort of ended his comments with that, which I was going to say, but he's already, uh, he mentioned it as well. So I appreciate that on various levels. Um, just that, you know, I think that we all have, you know, different paths, different journeys, or we have a similar faith. And, um, you know, I just grew up in, in a family, Hopkins family, where everything was, you know, it was like family, faith, community, right? And country. That's another question. Uh, but I was from the South. Um, and we all, you know, Father always talked about local people, local events, even as you do national things. So I've always been organizing people. I mean, you know, we don't necessarily get paid for it, but I was a student organizer in high school. I was a student organizer in college. 
uh, before I went to graduate school, I spent five years as a community organizer in Harlem. I mean, the old Malcolm X Harlem, not the, I mean, the old. And then, you know, even when I was in graduate school, I was working with, my, I was working with the Ministry of Old Black People in Bedford-Stuyvesant when I was in, getting my PhD at Union. So I was help organizing them. And then even when I moved to Oakland, California, I was at Santa Clara, I was at Allen Temple Baptist Church, but I was still organizing people in East Oakland. And then when I came to Chicago, same thing, 18 years out there, two o'clock in the morning uh, for 20 years, actually. No, 20 years. And uh, so I'm always, that's what my reference is. That's just a natural reference. When I talk about people, community, faith, I'm talking with those specific people who we held hands together, we buried people together, we married people together for 20 years. It may come out very theoretical, but that's that's my root. Um, I'm gonna get, take a couple of questions now from the audience. Uh, this first question, Dwight, this one is uh, directed to you. It seems that Christians' view of what is pejoratively called the prosperity gospel is often racialized. Privileged white evangelicals are strongly critical while many Black believers strongly believe that true faith and justice should indeed lead to equity, material blessings, and advancement. Do you see this disconnect in your circles? If so, how do you understand it, given your contention that faith plus wealth equals freedom? Oh, thank you. Thank you. Great question. I hope somebody will throw that, throw that curveball at me. Um, my understanding of prosperity gospel, it says uh, those pastors who say, well, if you don't get your Mercedes Benz, or if you don't get an education, or you don't have a great job, it's because you, the believer, don't have enough faith in Jesus. So it's more, my, that's the circles, at least in Chicago land that I've encountered it, you know, 20, 20 some years. So it's, it's, it's blaming everyday people, and it's usually everyday people who are saying, well, you don't have what you want, you don't, you have you, the material blessings that you want, aren't coming forth because you don't you don't have faith enough, you aren't praying enough, or you aren't tithing enough. So what I'm doing is saying that we need to have faith plus wealth equals freedom. And the faith is driven by sort of a, a this um, view, as I mentioned, from Exodus 3, from um, Luke 4, and from Matthew, the sheep and the goats, driven that way. And two, it's to have people on a local on local areas work together in community to leverage whatever resources they have to help families to help the church help the community and also also leave enough to help people who are suffering even less than they are so it's a little different from you know the, uh, the prosperity gospel uh we're not we're not blaming anybody we're just saying look you know based on the christian i understand the christian message I mean, as jonathan said it's based on hope it's based on resurrection you know which was a couple of sundays ago that's you know hallelujah there's a valley one has to go through. And that valley can seem like it's endless, particularly in communities. Well, let me people I've been working with, you know, for the last 40 years. Uh, but believe it or not, a lot of those, and again, I'm talking about my the communities I know, I'm not talking about this 40 million black people. I'm talking with the people I've been working with. Okay. And uh, you know, it's just always surprises me that folks will have a hallelujah Sunday. I mean, they have, I mean, you know, it's like death doesn't have the last word. I mean, it's amazing. You know, I teach this stuff. I, but th these folks, they have been struggling for generations and they found a way. I give one other example about how they, their worldview, which impacts their faith, driven by Christian hope and using resources that they have, the local people that, are, and you may have remembered that, um, I guess it was like Tuesday, the Supreme Court rendered against Harvard about you can't use race, ethnicity as a criteria for admissions. So they had some of my friends who were on MSBC <laughs> and they were saying it's white supremacy, it's but Asian males attacking black people. And, and then there's every black, every major black community has their own local AM store. So if you want ethno ethnography of the people, go to those AM stores. So I was listening to you know, friends I know who are MSBC and they're commentators seeing it black, you know, we all know. And then they were saying, oh, you know, white males and the white people and Asian men are taking, you know, they want a victory because race, ethnicity can't be. And so then I turned on, you know, the local AM and they had a whole, of course it was big news and, and black women, black women were calling, you could tell you the church women, you know, they said, well, child, we got to switch up now. We got to, we got to start teaching ABCs in, in kindergarten that we got to get ready for. So their whole view was proactive. You know, it was just totally different from, from my buddies and friends who accommodate us there. And not that either one is bad because to me, you need both. You know, we can have naive optimism with a naive Christianity, you know, and get swept into prosperity gospel. 
and also we can have a, a naive other way. So it's just, um, I see prosperity gospel one way and I see what we're trying to do another way. Uh, Jonathan, I have a question now uh, for you here. Uh, someone asked, uh, the Redeemer community that you write about is doing amazing and groundbreaking things, but it's also very small. Uh, and from what I can tell, it's led by some extraordinary talented individuals. Uh, not everyone is able to kind of, you know, start up a multi-million dollar software company like, like Dayspring. Uh, it worries me that what they are doing is not scalable. What does the Redeemer, what does the Redeemer model look like for regular people? Yeah, this is a, a really good uh, and important question. It's a serious question. I mean, Redeemer, it was created by a bunch of friends that decided to raise their children together in relationship to the children in their neighborhood and came to see the realities of systemic racism full bore in the lives of their friends that they lived with uh, and went to school with, et cetera, et cetera. Um, I don't think they've ever thought we're going to scale up. I think they've always thought we're a community church. Uh, we're responsible to the Bayview Hunters Point community. We're called to that. That's sufficiently large. Um, that ecology is sufficiently complex. Uh, those sets of relationships come with, you know, histories that they need to inhabit. There, There is an interesting set of questions about scalability. I mean, this this takes place in the, in the margins of uh, not simply a metropole of America, but a metropole of global capital. It's Silicon Valley, one of the most powerful parts of the global economy and the world. And so scalability is entirely the set, the question. Uh, we're talking about people who speak the language of saying things like it is only the hundreds of millions of dollars that is a serious amount of money. Uh, you could say the same thing in a school that will only educate um, dozens at a time. Is that scalable? Um, a software company that only works with so many clients and can only redistribute to so many, not only sit, not, not even a city or even a part of a city, but several city blocks. I think the question I always have about scale is what survives scale? What, you know, we think of scale as what can be produced and benefited by scale and scope, but there's also questions about what is lost. And my guess is the bounds, uh, the things that bind communities is lost. I mean, one of the worries about say financial capitalism is the more you get to, you know, you get increasingly abstracted away from workers, laborers, local businesses, how environmental effects happen because you're resourcing this and that. Um, but those questions are also unavoidable. One of the really interesting things about the Redeemer community, and I only talk a little bit about this in the book, is in the second and third generation of Redeemer people, they're drawing um, uh, people like um, Professor Hopkins, a venture capitalist, <laughs> who are drawn to Redeemer because of the ingenuity uh, of imagining economy as shared with those in community. I mean, I, I take one big difference between certain versions of the prosperity gospel and what Professor Hopkins is talking about is that he imagines communities generating wealth to give away wealth. Um, and so what we're talking about then is a different mo a different mechanism of redistribution. I think a lot of my friends are talking about redistribution at a much larger scaled version. Uh, and I, I think this is where the language of abolition comes into play. Um, but what about local communities and what are the ways we can redistribute? And so the venture capitalists are really attracted to uh, Redeemer, I think, because they're practicing on a smaller scale what venture people are often thinking at a large scale. That is, what are the entrepreneurial intersections uh, through which we can reimagine common life and its concrete realities? Uh, and so the same kinds of gifted genius ways of thinking operate. And, and I imagine that's the mutual attraction. I want to, uh, I want to put a question to both of you, uh, that draws on you and your work as theologians. Um, this comes actually just from my reading your own work. Um, Dwight, I want to ask you about why the doctrine of creation should help us think creatively about wealth, how it helps us even as in some ways a prophetic uh, witness to us and how we relate to wealth. Um, Jonathan, I want to ask you about 
this idea of deep incarnation and uh, and how the person of Jesus under and you're going to explain deep incarnation for us might help us to uh, think about uh, how our faith is a more gives us a more wide encompassing responsibilities. Um, Dwight, could I ask you to speak to how you see creation, uh, the doctrine of creation, the theology of creation, impacting our view of wealth? My understanding of the doctrine of creation is that God was not forced or compelled to create anything or any person. And so creation itself is an act, is a process of building community out of one's love and forgiveness. Um, it's also an act of, of providing abundance because as the story goes, in the original creation of Adam and Eve, everything was provided. There were some warrants where they couldn't do, but everything was provided. Uh, and they symbolize a family, how I want to define family today, is, but in that story, it's a particular family that was created, um, and they were all asked to multiply. Uh, they were also asked to be in communion with all of there is nature, you know, depending on how you interpret stewardship from the original languages in the Old Testament, but that's how I, I interpret it and translate it. So the act of creation was grace. Grace is something that's it's given out of love. It's not compelled. It's not forced. It's not an obligation. So creation itself is that. And also in the process of creation, uh, Yahweh or God, Adonai, whatever word what, what we want to use, um, gave it away. Yeah, God gave God's power to everyone and God's resource to everyone and God's love to everyone. So again, it's a whole point of redistribution or democratizing or changing the whole systems or whatever you want to call it. One can call, at least for me, that's what it is. And it's um, and as we know in the story, there's the the you know, the Adam and Eve and the serpent, as the story goes, um, introduces some very bad things, whether it's sin or the fall of humanity, which says again, there's always a valley. Anybody who doesn't talk about the valley experience before they get to the mountaintop have not been in the valley themselves, have not been in pain. And so we're aware of that. It's not a naive hallelujah, you know, celebration. It's a it's a it's a it's a it's to be created, but stuff struggle with the suffering parts of being a human being, and at the same time, even while we're healing the wounds, we know that, you know, pain doesn't last always. It does not last always, and that's the hallelujah moment that creation gives us. That even though there was pain, that literally, you know, the woman is described with pain, and Adam described with pain, and the snake with pain. There's <laughs> a lot of pain in the story, but um, somebody came, you know, a little later. Uh, Jesus, you know, and that represents a lot. It's the hope. It's the hope. It really is the hope. And you got to just, and I've seen it, you know, I've, I've seen it. I really have seen it with people in the communities, you know, just, I don't know how they do it. You know, if somebody, if my son, son was shot or if I lost, you know, if I lost a daughter, if I, if, you know, if, I mean, you know, this is stuff that doesn't get on, doesn't get on, you know, on cable. I was, I, you know, I was like, hey, you know, I'm, I'm going to go to, I'm, I'm moving to Ecuador, I'm moving to, you know, Fiji somewhere, and those people persist. It's just amazing. So, um, I think creation is is a gift. It's a gift to be shared. It's a gift to be shared that is also involved in pain, but it's also to recognize that this gift. There's no way you can stamp this gift out. It's going to be a hallelujah moment at some point. Uh, the um, it's great that you thought about the question about creation and then the question about incarnation. It shows your own kind of theological uh, intuitions, Dr. Rice. Um, yeah, th th those are synonymous questions or related, deeply related questions to me. We tend to tell the story, especially those of us on the other side of the Reformation, tend to tell the story of um, creation and incarnation as radically discontinuous. So you, th in this story, you have God created in the way that Dwight talked about in abundance, in a sustained way that articulates in every fiber of its being grace. And then you have the fall and then the world has just gone, you know, to hell in a handbasket. Creation is utterly ruined. And then incarnation comes as a kind of shock to this world uh, in a way that it could have never been anticipated. I think that's a way that we elevate the grace nature of the incarnation, but I think we might want to think about telling where there's greater continuity between creation and incarnation, that creation was already graced in so far as it's God's. Uh, and there's no amount of human sin or depravity or distortion or desire to make it our own to, pri you know, towards privation 
that can ruin that because God is God and we're not. Um, so even in the midst of fallenness, creation um, anticipates more God, not just our, announces God in the past, but anticipates God in, into the future. And so incarnation is an intensification of this reality. What deep incarnation, there's a number of theologians in the last decade and a half have pushed this idea of deep incarnation is that the, that anticipation isn't simply humans, um, that the incarnation of Christ is incarnated into all of creation. And so this is, of course, inspired by um, environmentalist concerns that we Christians or religious people too often tell the story, not simply of discon discontinuity between creation and incarnation, but discontinuity between human and creation. So if God came as incarnated as not simply fully human, but fully creation, fully creature, uh, then that then the work of justice and mercy that is internal to Christ is internal to all things. Or as I try to say in the book, justice and mercy are natural to the world because justice and mercy are natural to God. Uh, and we live in continuity with the world that God gave us. I'm grateful for both of your work. I think that your experience and investment in this testifies to uh, a hope that there is some good that can come out of asking and getting into these big questions, looking at our, our markets and how we relate to them. And then I think the way you've spoken to the Christian faith, the hope that we have in that uh, testifies a great deal. So thank you both for being guests on the God and Money Theology Lab.